Lesson 6 Struggling with all energy Sabbath afternoon, July 30 In order that God might qualify him for his great work as the keeper of the sacred oracles, Abraham must be separated from the associations of his early life. The influence of kindred and friends would interfere with the training which the Lord purposed to give his servant. It was no light test that was thus brought upon Abraham, no small sacrifice that was required of him. There were strong ties to bind him to his country, his kindred, and his home. But he did not hesitate to obey the call. Many are still tested as was Abraham. They do not hear the voice of God speaking directly from the heavens, but he calls them by the teachings of his word and the events of his providence. They may be required to abandon a career that promises wealth and honor, to leave congenial and profitable associations, and separate from kindred to enter upon what appears to be only a path of self-denial, hardship, and sacrifice. He leads them to feel the need of his help and to depend upon him alone that he may reveal himself to them. Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 126 and 127. Why is it that religion occupies so little of our attention while the world has the strength of brain, bone, and muscle? It is because the whole force of our being is bent in that direction. We have trained ourselves to engage with earnestness and power in worldly business until it is easy for the mind to take that turn. This is why Christians find a religious life so hard and a worldly life so easy. The faculties have been trained to exert their force in that direction. In religious life, there has been an assent to the truths of God's Word, but not a practical illustration of them in the life. To cultivate religious thoughts and devotional feelings is not made a part of education. These should influence and control the entire being. The habit of doing right is wanting. There is spasmodic action under favorable influences, but to think naturally and readily upon divine things is not the ruling principle of the mind. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, page 264. It is by close testing trials that God disciplines his servants. He sees that some have powers which may be used in the advancement of his work, and he puts these persons upon trial. In his providence, he brings them into positions that test their character and reveal defects and weaknesses that have been hidden from their own knowledge. He gives them opportunity to correct these defects and to fit themselves for his service. He shows them their own weakness and teaches them to lean upon Him, for He is their only help and safeguard. When God calls them to action, they are ready, and heavenly angels can unite with them in the work to be accomplished on the earth. Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 129 and 130. Sunday July 31. The Spirit of Truth. The Spirit came upon the waiting, praying disciples with a fullness that reached every heart. The Infinite One revealed Himself in power to His Church. It was as if for ages this influence had been held in restraint, and now heaven rejoiced in being able to pour out upon the Church the riches of the Spirit's grace. And under the influence of the Spirit, Words of penitence and confession mingled with songs of praise for sins forgiven. Words of thanksgiving and of prophecy were heard. All heaven bent low to behold and to adore the wisdom of matchless, incomprehensible love. Lost in wonder, the apostles exclaimed, Herein is love. They grasped the imparted gift. And what followed? The sword of the Spirit newly edged with power and bathed in the lightnings of heaven, cut its way through unbelief. The Acts of the Apostles, page 38 The Spirit is given as a regenerating agency to make effectual the salvation wrought by the death of our Redeemer.
The Spirit is constantly seeking to draw the attention of men to the great offering that was made on the cross of Calvary, to unfold to the world the love of God, and to open to the convicted soul the precious things of the Scriptures. Having brought conviction of sin and presented before the mind the standard of righteousness, the Holy Spirit withdraws the affections from the things of this earth and fills the soul with a desire for holiness. He will guide you into all truth, John chapter 16, verse 13, the Savior declared. If men are willing to be molded, there will be brought about a sanctification of the whole being. The Spirit will take the things of God and stamp them on the soul. By His power, the way of life will be made so plain that none need err therein. The Acts of the Apostles, pages 52 and 53. As trials thicken around us, both separation and unity will be seen in our ranks. Some who are now ready to take up weapons of warfare will in times of real peril make it manifest that they have not built upon the solid rock. They will yield to temptation. Those who have had great light and precious privileges but have not improved them will under one pretext or another go out from us. Not having received the love of the truth, they will be taken in the delusions of the enemy. They will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils and will depart from the faith. But on the other hand, when the storm of persecution really breaks upon us, the true sheep will hear the true shepherd's voice. Self-denying efforts will be put forth to save the lost, and many who have strayed from the fold will come back to follow the great shepherd. The people of God will draw together and present to the enemy a united front. In view of the common peril, strife for supremacy will cease. There will be no disputing as to who shall be accounted greatest. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, pages 400 and 401. Monday August 1. The Divine-Human Combination The agency of the Spirit of God does not remove from us the necessity of exercising our faculties and talents, but teaches us how to use every power to the glory of God. The human faculties, when under the special direction of the grace of God, are capable of being used to the best purpose on earth. Ignorance does not increase the humility or spirituality of any professed follower of Christ. The truths of the divine word can be best appreciated by an intellectual Christian. Christ can be best glorified by those who serve him intelligently. The great object of education is to enable us to use the power which God has given us in such a manner as to represent the religion of the Bible and promote the glory of God. We are indebted to Him who gave us existence for the talents that have been entrusted to us, and it is a duty we owe our Creator to cultivate and improve these talents. Education will discipline the mind, develop its powers, and understandingly direct them that we may be useful in advancing the glory of God. Counsels to Parents, Teachers, and Students, pages 361 and 362. I saw evil angels contending for souls, and angels of God resisting them. The conflict was severe. Evil angels were crowding about them, corrupting the atmosphere with their poisonous influence and stupefying their sensibilities. Holy angels were anxiously watching these souls and were waiting to drive back Satan's host. But it is not the work of good angels to control minds against the will of the individuals. If they yield to the enemy and make no effort to resist him, then the angels of God can do but little more than hold in check the host of Satan that they should not destroy until further light be given to those in peril to move them to arouse and look to heaven for help. Jesus will not commission holy angels to extricate those who make no effort to help themselves. If Satan sees he is in danger of losing one soul, he will exert himself to the utmost to keep that one. 
and when the individual is aroused to his danger and with distress and fervor looks to Jesus for strength, Satan fears he shall lose a captive and he calls a reinforcement of his angels to hedge in the poor soul and form a wall of darkness around him that heaven's light may not reach him. But if the one in danger perseveres and in helplessness and weakness casts himself upon the merits of the blood of Christ, Jesus listens to the earnest prayer of faith and sends a reinforcement of those angels which excel in strength to deliver him. And when angels, all-powerful, clothed with the armory of heaven, come to the help of the fainting pursued soul, Satan and his host fall back well knowing that their battle is lost. Messages to Young People, pages 52 and 53. Tuesday, August 2. The Disciplined Will We have each of us an individual work to do to gird up the loins of our minds, to be sober, to watch unto prayer. The mind must be firmly controlled to dwell upon subjects that will strengthen the moral powers. The thoughts must be pure. The meditations of the heart must be clean if the words of the mouth are to be words acceptable to heaven and helpful to your associates. The mind should be guarded carefully. Nothing should be allowed to enter that will harm or destroy its healthy vigor. But to prevent this, it should be preoccupied with good seed, which springing to life will bring forth fruit bearing branches. He who finds joy and happiness in reading the Word of God and in the hour of prayer is constantly refreshed by drafts from the fountain of life. He will attain a height of moral excellence and a breath of thought of which others cannot conceive. Communion with God encourages good thoughts, noble aspirations, clear perceptions of truth, and lofty purposes of action. Those who thus connect their souls with God are acknowledged by Him as His sons and daughters. They are constantly reaching higher and still higher, obtaining clear views of God and of eternity, until the Lord makes them channels of light and wisdom to the world. My Life Today, page 83 Few realize that it is a duty to exercise control over the thoughts and imaginations. It is difficult to keep the undisciplined mind fixed upon profitable subjects. But if the thoughts are not properly employed, religion cannot flourish in the soul. The mind must be preoccupied with sacred and eternal things, or it will cherish trifling and superficial thoughts. Both the intellectual and the moral powers must be disciplined, and they will strengthen and improve by exercise. In order to understand this matter aright, we must remember that our hearts are naturally depraved and we are unable of ourselves to pursue a right course. It is only by the grace of God, combined with the most earnest effort on our part, that we can gain the victory. God's Amazing Grace, page 327 for the Lord God will help me, therefore shall I not be confounded, therefore have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. Isaiah chapter 50 verse 7 Strength of character consists of two things, power of will and power of self-control. Many youth mistake strong, uncontrolled passion for strength of character. But the truth is that he who is mastered by his passions is a weak man. The real greatness and nobility of the man is measured by the power of the feelings that he subdues, not by the power of the feelings that subdue him. The strongest man is he who, while sensitive to abuse, will yet restrain passion and forgive his enemies. Such men are true heroes. The Faith I Live By, page 316 Wednesday, August 3. Radical Commitment The Christian life is a warfare. The Apostle Paul speaks of wrestling against principalities and powers as he fought the good fight of faith. Again, he declares, Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. 
Ah, no. Today's sin is cherished and excused. The sharp sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, does not cut to the soul. Has religion changed? Has Satan's enmity to God abated? A religious life once presented difficulties and demanded self-denial. All is made very easy now. And why is this? The professed people of God have compromised with the power of darkness. There must be a revival of the straight testimony. The path to heaven is no smoother now than in the days of our Savior. All our sins must be put away. Every darling indulgence that hinders our religious life must be cut off. The right eye or the right hand must be sacrificed if it cause us to offend. Are we willing to renounce our own wisdom and to receive the kingdom of heaven as a little child? Are we willing to part with self-righteousness? Are we willing to give up our chosen worldly associates? Are we willing to sacrifice the approbation of men? The prize of eternal life is of infinite value. Will we put forth efforts and make sacrifices proportionate to the worth of the object to be attained? Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 222. It will require a sacrifice to give yourself to God, but it is a sacrifice of the lower for the higher, the earthly for the spiritual, the perishable for the eternal. God does not design that our will should be destroyed, for it is only through its exercise that we can accomplish what He would have us do. Our will is to be yielded to Him, that we may receive it again, purified and refined, and so linked in sympathy with the divine that He can pour through us the tides of His love and power. However bitter and painful this surrender may appear to the willful wayward heart, yet it is profitable for thee. Not until he fell crippled and helpless upon the breast of the covenant angel did Jacob know the victory of conquering faith and receive the title of a prince with God. So the captain of our salvation was made perfect through sufferings, Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10, and the children of faith out of weakness were made strong and turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 34. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 62. What kind of faith is it that overcomes the world? It is that faith which makes Christ your own personal Savior, that faith which, recognizing your helplessness, your utter inability to save yourself, takes hold of the Helper who is mighty to save as your only hope. It is faith that will not be discouraged, that hears the voice of Christ saying, Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world, and my divine strength is yours. It is the faith that hears him say, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Reflecting Christ, page 21. Thursday, August 4. The Need to Persevere The warfare which we are to wage is the good fight of faith. I also labor, said the Apostle Paul, striving according to his working which worketh in me mightily. Colossians chapter 1 verse 29. Jacob in the great crisis of his life turned aside to pray. He was filled with one overmastering purpose, to seek for transformation of character. But while he was pleading with God, an enemy, as he supposed, placed his hand upon him, and all night he wrestled for his life. But the purpose of his soul was not changed by peril of life itself. When his strength was nearly spent, the angel put forth his divine power, and at his touch Jacob knew him with whom he had been contending. Wounded and helpless, he fell upon the Savior's breast, pleading for a blessing. He would not be turned aside nor cease his intercession, and Christ granted the petition of this helpless, penitent soul according to his promise, Let him take hold of my strength, that he may make peace with me, and he shall make peace with me. Isaiah chapter 27 verse 5. Jacob pleaded with determined spirit, 
I will not let thee go except thou bless me. Genesis chapter 32 verse 26. This spirit of persistence was inspired by him who wrestled with the patriarch. It was he who gave him the victory, and he changed his name from Jacob to Israel, saying, As a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. Genesis chapter 32, verse 28. That for which Jacob had vainly wrestled in his own strength was won through self-surrender and steadfast faith. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 144. God requires all to possess moral courage, steadiness of purpose, fortitude and perseverance, minds that cannot take the assertions of another, but which will investigate for themselves before receiving or rejecting, that will study and weigh evidence and take it to the Lord in prayer. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Now the condition, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. This petition for wisdom is not to be a meaningless prayer out of mind as soon as finished. It is a prayer that expresses the strong, earnest desire of the heart arising from a conscious lack of wisdom to determine the will of God. After the prayer is made, if the answer is not realized immediately, do not weary of waiting and become unstable. Waver not, cling to the promise, faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Like the importunate widow, urge your case, being firm in your purpose. Is the object important? and of great consequence to you? It certainly is. Then waver not, for your faith may be tried. If the thing you desire is valuable, it is worthy of a strong, earnest effort. You have the promise. Watch and pray. Be steadfast, and the prayer will be answered, for is it not God who has promised? If it costs you something to obtain it, you will prize it the more when obtained. You are plainly told that if you waver, you need not think that you shall receive anything of the Lord. A caution is here given not to become weary, but to rest firmly upon the promise. If you ask, He will give you liberally and upbraid not. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, pages 130 and 131. For further reading, follow Christ's example of sacrifice, page 235, and Patriarchs and Prophets, The Night of Wrestling, pages 195 to 203. For further reading.